Okay. Well, I, I suppose now is a, a good time to get started if other folks are still joining, um, um, they can do so. Uh, but I'll start with just an introduction. I, I want to welcome everyone to this Solar on the Farm webinar. Uh, my name is Drew Chavon, and I'm an Energy Extension Specialist with the University of Maryland, and I'll, I'll serve as the uh, facilitator for today's webinar. Um, and I'll give you a little information on uh, the University of Maryland Extension and, and what we do. It's really to provide uh, information, tools, resources, uh, technical assistance through workshops and webinars like this. Um, uh, to uh, inform and guide um, uh, various clients that we deal with on uh, a host of topics. And I'll, I'll get into some of that uh, momentarily, but um, uh, before I do, I'll, I'll just like to acknowledge uh, the support of the U.S. Department of Agriculture through their uh, Northeast Sustainable Agricultural Research and Education Program, uh, who has uh, funded um, much of the work we've done uh, with solar energy and uh, supported uh, related efforts. Um, and uh, I want to say, as, as you might see, the program is being recorded, uh, and the uh, recording uh, will be shared uh, with all registrations, um, all those that are registered for this program. Uh, you'll get an email later this week. Uh, this recording will be also be posted to our website, extension.umb.edu, uh, um, and, and I'll share those uh, uh, web addresses with you uh, later, but um, they'll be available online. We'll also share any of the accompanying resources in the slide presentation as well. So if you do have to jump out early, I'm not encouraging that, but uh, we'd welcome you to stay for, throughout the program today. But uh, these resources will be made available following the program. Um, <clears throat> with that said, let me give you a quick overview of the uh, uh, technical um, overview here of our program. I, I think most of us are familiar with uh, Zoom or webinar formats here, but just as a, a little caveat here, you should be muted, but if you do have any um, questions or need technical assistance, we'll, we'll go through this now. Uh, if you need any help uh, connecting, uh, please send uh, a message to the technical assistance and we'll be happy to uh, help guide you through that. Uh, so if you have problems with the connection or something like that or the audio, please let us know. Uh, any questions that you have for the panelists and speakers today, please uh, use that Q&A feature. You can type your question in there. Um, We'll try to address any questions as we go, but we've primarily um, we're primarily going to answer those questions that you input there at the end of our program. So we'll allow our speakers and panelists to uh, uh, present their uh, um, their their presentation, and then we'll have the questions at the end. But feel free to put those in at any point. Again, there's the website where the recording will go. Um, it'll be at the extension.umd.edu, and a quick way to get to there is just with a forward slash energy, um, and it'll be uh, the recording and any of these resources will be housed somewhere on there, um, but that's that'll be made available, and I'll, I'll share this with you later as well as a reminder. Um, a little bit more information on the University of Maryland uh, Extension. We're the largest department of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources at UMD College Park. Uh, we have uh, over 300 faculty and staff housed in offices in all 23 counties, as well as Baltimore City. Uh, and as part, of the, as part of the land grant institution, we provide research-based educational programs and informational resources to the public uh, with, the, with the goal of improving the lives of, lives of individuals, families, and communities throughout the state. Uh, we do this through various educational initiatives and non-credit programs that address, address various topics. And I've highlighted some of those directly from the website. You'll see uh, a plant and animal agriculture, natural resources, uh, things dealing with forestry and water quality, and of course, environment and energy. And, and that brings us to our discussion today, uh, discussing solar energy. Um, but we deal with a number of other topics um, uh, as well, energy conservation, energy efficiency, and other energy systems. Um, but you'll find much of that information, uh, resources and contact information, um, housed on our website at, at uh, extension.umd.edu. Um, I've highlighted there on the map as well, my home office is in Washington County at the Western Maryland Research and Education Center. Um, and so if you're ever coming through the area, you're welcome to uh, drop by and visit and ask any questions that you may have. Uh, I'd love to connect with you on that. Um, but that's a little snapshot of um, who we are with the University of Maryland. And I'll mention at this time, um, you know, really all of the uh, 
applied research and education that we deliver to the public. It's really research-based information. It's, it's, and, and I want to emphasize this, and, and I'll probably do so throughout our program today, but our, our goal is not to uh, market or sale or advocate for uh, solar energy or any technology. Um, we're really going to provide unbiased research-based information to you to help you make an informed decision if solar is a good fit for your operation or not. Uh, but that's really uh, conveyed in all the programs that we deliver uh, across the board. And so uh, you'll see that reflected in, in today's webinar as well. I've uh, highlighted a, a number of resources available on our website that you may be interested in related to solar energy. And I'll just briefly mention these before we get started. But uh, we have a number of videos, uh, including uh, previous webinars and seminars that we've uh, hosted dealing with uh, solar energy and other energy related topics. Uh, we have a um, uh, do-it-yourself kind of training videos as well with solar energy uh, for those of you that might uh, be inclined to install a small uh, uh, residential or farm-based system. Uh, or if you're just looking to learn more information about solar energy and how it works, some of the components, uh, those would be some useful resources. You can find our YouTube uh, channel there, Energy UME uh, is that channel, or you can go through it uh, through our uh, main extension.umd.edu webpage, and there'll be links to those videos as well. We also have a number of publications on um, residential, commercial, and other uh, solar applications and other energy topics. You're welcome to uh, access any of those resources. Uh, I'll include a list of some of those resources and a follow-up email to this program as well. If you're interested in specific ones, I'll, I'll highlight some of those. Uh, and, and the last thing I'll highlight is our energy newsletter. It goes out quarterly. Our next issue will be out in October. Uh, this newsletter is a great resource for all things energy in the state of Maryland. It, it gives an update each quarter about uh, interesting projects and big initiatives in the state um, covering solar and a number of other topics. Uh, we have uh, a list of upcoming workshops, programs, and videos that are available, as well as uh, a list of finances of grants and loans that are available to help uh, implement projects. So that's a great re resource. I, I believe the newsletter was part of the registration process for this webinar, but if you uh, want to look at back issues or to uh, subscribe, if you missed that earlier, you can go uh, to our website, or uh, you can use this link, go.umd.edu slash energy news, and you'll be able to subscribe to our newsletter there and get information about upcoming events uh, like this webinar that you're on today. <clears throat> so that is a bit about uh, uh, who we are with the University of Maryland Extension, uh, and, and I'll introduce some of our panelists and speakers a little in a little bit, but uh, I want to go ahead and get a little feedback uh, it would be helpful for us to know who's joining the program today so we can tailor our conversation uh, to this group a bit. Uh, but I'll, I'll ask this first question. So if you're uh, behind your computer, uh, you should be able to see uh, a question pop up on your screen, uh, essentially describing what your interest is in today's webinar. Uh, and, and you can select multiple options there, but uh, whether you're interested in installing a ground mounted system or a rooftop system on your, uh, could be a barn or your home. Um, if you're coming from any other uh, area, please indicate. And, and that'll just help us to, to tailor the conversation to that. So I'll give you a few minutes just to uh, read through that on your own and, and uh, provide an indication of um, your background and interest in, in today's webinar. Okay, and I know the, I don't believe the answers will be um, reflected in the video recording. So I'll just say, looks like about half of the, um, half of those in attendance today are interested in uh, ground mounted systems, a large percentage interested in 42% uh, in rooftop uh, systems for a barn or shed. Um, we have a number of other um, uh, interests as well in, uh, academia, uh, support, um, government nonprofit advocacy, and other groups as well. Uh, and I see, okay, so I see all questions when at once. I, I was uh, unaware of that, but thank you for answering those additional questions. Uh, your electric utility provider, uh, it looks like uh, we have a lot from 22% uh, from, from Delmarva. Uh, Smiko's got 20%, 22% uh, BG&E. 
And uh, additional, we have some from uh, Delmarva, some from uh, other utilities as well. Uh, and the third and final question, uh, so thank you for responding to each of these. Uh, how much do you know about solar? Uh, we have a lot uh, in the intermediate range, about 36% uh, would believe that they know reasonably about solar. About 36% equally uh, know uh, a little bit about solar and would identify as uh, beginners in this. We do have some that are more novice and some that are more advanced and a few, uh, at least 2% uh, that are experts in this. So glad to have uh, uh, all of you as part of this program today. So you're in the right place and uh, we'll, we'll go forward from here. Okay, the rest of the survey questions have been answered. So thank you again. And uh, at this time, I'll introduce the panelists uh, for today's webinar. First up is uh, myself. Uh, again, my name is Drew Chavon. I serve as an energy extension specialist with uh, University of Maryland. Uh, and in my role with the university, I, I coordinate applied research and deliver educational programs uh, in the areas of energy conservation and uh, clean energy technology. Uh, next up uh, is, is Paul Goringer, who is an extension specialist out of our agricultural and resource economics department. He specializes in legal risk management related to agriculture, and you'll find that he's quite knowledgeable in the areas of uh, environmental compliance, right to farm laws, agricultural leasing laws, contracting issues, and estate planning uh, issues, among other things. Uh, then we'll have uh, Dr. Fairbors uh, Majori, uh, who is the CEO of Aurora, Aurora Solar. Uh, overseeing project development and uh, where he serves as the program manager for large commercial projects. And, and Dr. Majori, uh, he has over 40 years of experience in power and renewable energy. He's worked on a number of high profile projects, including um, a proposal development for a new solar system at the White House, solar thermal and lighting systems at the Pentagon, uh, and the NSA rooftop PV system. Uh, Dr. Majori is a NAVSEP professional installer and a registered uh, professional engineer in Maryland, DC and Virginia. And finally, we'll have Cord Briggs also joining us from Aurora Solar. He's the managing director overseeing day-to-day -day operations. And he also brings with him quite a bit of experience in developing rooftop ground mount and carport solar projects. After receiving his MBA, uh, Briggs worked uh, for a solar construction company in Singapore overseeing development of uh, 18 megawatts of solar installations there. So uh, we've got a, a great lineup here um, and uh, looking forward to some of the input from some of the other speakers. But uh, like I said, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and launch into our first presentation and um, I'll try to keep my part brief. I know we have some that are more familiar with solar than others, but um, I'll kind of touch on some of the basics of uh, uh, solar energy before we get into the details. But I wanted to uh, start this presentation and this program today with kind of a fundamental overview of solar energy because, uh, you know, from my experience as an engineer, we often get into a project into the nuts and bolts and the system design and, and kind of dive head first into that before we uh, truly understand and appreciate the context that solar plays in, in the whole energy sector. And so I thought it would be useful to cover uh, some of the basics of how a solar electric system works, uh, as well as some of the uh, uh, ways that it fits in with the rest of the um, energy market in Maryland. Um, solar energy is not the only technology out there. Um, it's not the silver bullet technology that uh, is, is going to hit every objective that you have necessarily, uh, but it does have a, a very powerful role in, in, the, in the greater context of of uh, the energy marketplace. And so talk about how it kind of fits in with other energy resources and then look at uh, where it's going as well. Some of the in in incentives, uh, not in detail, but some of the policies and initiatives in the state that are promoting solar uh, and making it a more viable technology for many of us to, to install. Um, and, and so I'll cover some of those fundamentals here going forward. But the first question I thought I would answer is where does energy come from? Um, and, uh, you know, I wanted to share this, uh, you know, graph here to give us some indication of where it fits in with some of the other uh, more traditional energy resources. And so two things I want to point out here. Uh, number one, we're heavily uh, dependent on fossil fuels. And, um, and we're also a net energy consumer in Maryland. We uh, consume quite a bit of energy more than we produce. And, and so you'll see we import a lot of our natural gas. 
uh, we're, we're importing that for various uses, uh, but we're, we're not generators of, of those uh, fuel resources. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is uh, the renewable portion towards the bottom, which would include solar, uh, among other things like wind. Uh, renewable accounts for a much smaller proportion of that. And so we're looking at a, a smaller fraction of that. And we'll, we'll kind of blow that up and magnify uh, what's happening on, on a, a bigger scale there as we go forward. But uh, I thought this would be valuable to share just so we understand uh, the context that it fits within. Um, and, and so you'll see that there. Um, but some of the uh, uh, initiatives and policies in place are, as I mentioned, are, are going to advance renewables like solar. And, and one of the biggest things is, is uh, what's called the Renewable Portfolio Standard. And like many states, Maryland's enacted an RPS, a Renewable Portfolio Standard. Ours is uh, setting a goal for 50% renewables by 2030. So we're about eight years out from that. Specifically, uh, and as we talk about solar in this program, we're looking at 14 and a half percent to come from solar energy. And I, I believe we're somewhere just shy of four and a half percent now. So we've got a ways to go in eight years. Uh, but every time the legislation um, uh, uh, bill goes through legislation and, and we have um, amendments to this or, or uh, uh, other related uh, initiatives and policies in place, it, it kind of boosts that industry forward and, and we'll see incentives and subsidies come in place that, that help promote uh, technologies like solar. Uh, but that's where we stand. Uh, just for a frame of reference, California has got a goal of 100% renewables. Uh, and so you'll see quite a bit of solar and other technologies there. Uh, Vermont is maybe 75%. Um, and there are other states out there that are, are fairly aggressive, Virginia. Uh, West Virginia, I'll say, um, no policies in place for renewable energy. And as a result, I, I believe they have like less than a 1% solar. Uh, it's a very, very small uh, amount of solar overall um, there. So uh, that that's just shows you the context that, that the difference between neighboring states, West Virginia having no policy in place is very little solar happening there, even though they have uh, a very good access to solar, just like we do here in Maryland. <clears throat> Uh, so with these policies and other initiatives like that, it's really advancing renewables. If you look on the left-hand side, I've shared kind of a perspective of where uh, the energy market will go. You'll see uh, their tr traditional fuel sources like coal will be on the decline. And so, you know, uh, coal in particular projected in the coming years to go down to about 11% um, of our energy use uh, uh, electricity generation. Rather, uh, this is this is pertaining to electricity generation. Our, our coal-fired power plants are, are aging, and uh, much of that those facilities are being decommissioned, um, and, and they're not being um, uh, revitalized. And so you'll see traditional fuel sources like coal on the decline, and you'll see renewables uh, being advanced. So renewables are expected to account for about 42 percent um, over the coming years. Uh, on the right-hand side, it's just kind of magnified of that renewable section. And so you'll see solar um, expected to account for about 47% of our electricity generation. So there's a lot of support for it moving forward. And I, I think uh, we can expect that to continue. A little bit uh, uh, closer look at, at what's happening in Maryland. Again, uh, you'll see solar rising from about uh, the uh, early 2010s, so around 2012, 2013 is when we saw solar energy begin to take off here in the state. Uh, and there's various reasons we won't get into uh, in detail today, but uh, solar is, is, is definitely on the climb uh, now. <clears throat> uh, here's where Maryland stands in terms of solar generation. Um, we, we're at uh, about 14, a little over 14 100 megawatts, 1,459 megawatts uh, of installed solar here in the state of Maryland. We're ranked, uh, uh, because of that, we're ranked about 18th currently in terms of how much solar is installed. Again, going back to, uh, you know, California, you'll see is number one with uh, 35, almost 36,000 uh, megawatts of installed solar. Again, a lot of that's because of the policies they have in place. And just to reiterate, uh, you know, our neighboring state, West Virginia, has only uh, I, I believe it's like uh, less than 0.1% uh, of their energy is from solar. Uh, and so again, 
uh, it just shows the context there. One of the other uh, things I'll point out is you look at uh, number 17, ranked number 17 right now is Illinois. They have a very similar uh, uh, capacity as us with the number of uh, megawatts as about 1465 for Illinois, uh, but they have about half of the installations that we have. And that's because Maryland has a lot of smaller scale installations. You'll see a lot of uh, smaller residential um, installations. Um, but we do here in Maryland, do, we do have larger projects as well, just mostly the smaller systems. So here's kind of a breakdown of what that looks like. Again, you'll see those bottom blue bars on this uh, bar graph represent the um, uh, residential size systems. So we're talking on average five uh, kilowatt systems, 10 kilowatt systems on average for your average home um, at, at most. Um, we do again have larger community solar projects. Uh, those are indicated in green on this graph and the light blue would be um, for the larger commercial projects. Uh, but that's that's some of the trend there. 2016, there was a, a big spike there, uh, probably in large part due to the uh, federal investment tax credit uh, that was uh, 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 set to expire, but was renewed uh, uh, later. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in the program today. Uh, here, here's for the overall US uh, in terms of solar uh, growth and capacity. You'll see uh, overall in the United States, we have a lot of utility uh, reflected in this chart. You see in that light blue, and that's again expected to increase over the coming years. So this is projected to 2030. Um, and so we're gonna see a lot of the larger projects come on board. We'll see some of those in Maryland. We've got some, you know, 50, uh, megawatt and 80 megawatt ones coming on board. There's, there's just are some larger projects out there, e even on, uh, even within our region, we'll see some of those larger projects. Um, and then quickly, I'll just give it kind of an overview of what the technology is, because I know we do have some that are newer to this conversation, but um, I do want to distinguish and we won't get into the the uh, you know scientific level understanding here. We're just going to touch on some of the basics. But I do want to distinguish between solar thermal and uh, solar PV or photovoltaics. And so, uh, solar thermal are those systems that have uh, some form of fluid. Fluid. It could be water or uh, something like propylene gly glycol moving through the uh, tubes. And uh, what what happens with solar thermal is you're just collecting the heat from the sun. And you would use that for like a heated swimming pool, hot water system. You could pass it through a radiator to do space heating. Uh, but when we talk about solar thermal, we're primarily talking about heating systems. Uh, but really what today's conversation is about is solar photovoltaics. And that's what we're talking about is, is creating electricity. Uh, and so if you're not familiar with that uh, photovoltaic term, uh, hopefully we'll uh, be more familiar through this program today, but photovoltaics or PV, it creates electricity. And so that's typically what we talk about when we're talking about uh, a rooftop solar or ground mounted solar. We're talking about uh, this solar photovoltaics or solar PV. Uh, and we can do anything we want with that electricity. We can send it onto the transmission grid. We can use it for any on site use that we have. Uh, if you have electric heating, like electric baseboards, you could use it for lighting systems or anything uh, in between. So that's really what we're going to spend our time discussing. Again, we're not going to get into the uh, nuts and bolts of how it works, but it's uh, to introduce some of the terminology here, I'll just talk on a smaller scale. We're looking at a, what's called a solar cell. It's just a silicon uh, wafer that, uh, that produces electricity when light shines on it. And we're not really going to go into much more detail beyond that today. Um, and then uh, most of us are going to be familiar with a solar panel or, or what's often called a solar module. Uh, you can call it solar panel or solar module, whatever you prefer. Uh, but that's what we're mostly familiar with seeing those big rectangular uh, blocks. It could be uh, 350 kilowatts or, or it could be a smaller 100, uh, uh, I'm sorry, one 100 watt system or, or the larger panels could be three, 400 watt uh, panels. Um, and basically they're just an aluminum frame for durability. It has a tempered glass and and all those different layers on it. And you'll see those cells are just kind of lined up in there. And those, those cells are hooked in series. And that's where you get your uh, current passing through those cells and the voltage adds up with those cells connected in series. Again, we're not going to go into the much more detail than that, but uh, just to introduce some of that terminology. Now, uh, 
here we have, uh, I think these are 250 watt panels, just as an example. When you hook these panels together in series uh, you, you're, or in parallel, uh, but typically uh, you're, you're hooking an array up in series here to increase the voltage up. Uh, but uh, uh, this is called a solar array when you have more than one panel. And so this is a small residential rooftop system here uh, uh, of these 200 watt uh, panels connected there. Uh, 250 watt, I, I think those are. Um, there are different types of panels out there, um, and, and there's a lot uh, of um, research going on to improve the efficiencies of some of these, but just some of the most common ones on the market today is, is going to be your what's called monocrystalline panels. Uh, that's the largest market share, and we're seeing most of the installations go in with monocrystalline. Some of the cheaper panels are polycrystalline, uh, and you won't see those as much anymore. Uh, the monocrystalline panels are uh, more of a solid black color, um, and, and so that's one way to tell them apart. And then they have those triangles or the diamonds in between each cell. And so that monocrystalline, it has a higher efficiency, uh, usually has a, a more sleek appearance to it. So it looks like a cleaner, uh, neater um, array when it's out in the field or up on the roof, um, but you'll see mostly monocrystalline. Those thin film and, and uh, you know they have kind of a unique application. They're flexible and can go in other places, but uh, they, they don't uh, are not used as widely, and their efficiencies are, are far lower, typically less than ten or fifteen percent. Uh, the monocrystalline panels are uh, you know upwards of 18, 21, 22 percent efficient, perhaps. Uh, it just depends on the brand and the manufacturer and and, uh, and the size panel, among other features of it. Uh, but that's kind of an overview of, of different panels that are out there. Uh, of course, you can mount the panel in various ways. Uh, here's, here's one example of a roof mounted system on shingles. You could do it on a standing seam metal roof as well. Uh, but this is common rooftop system here with an L foot and flashing. You're penetrating the roof with that. Um, there are other uh, ways to mount this on a flat roof. For instance, you could use a ballasted system that weighs it down, but uh, that, that's a roof mount system on the left. Uh, smaller system standalone applications uh, may require a pole mount. Um, and so here's just a cement footing here with a pole supporting uh, two panels on the top. Uh, so that's for your smaller standalone applications. And then ground mounted systems uh, for your larger projects, um, especially with the uh, utility scale solar farms, you'll see uh, specialized equipment come in and put those pilings in place to support the uh, framework and the solar panels. Uh, those those larger ground mounted systems require a little bit more energy analysis and and uh, permitting and other factors that we'll get into later in today's program. But that's kind of an overview of the different options available. Um, so that that's just the first piece of the puzzle, and there are many other uh, components to this system, and we're not going to get into it right now. Um, but uh, if you're integrating battery systems, uh, that's that's something. Uh, another piece you'll see is an inverter, and, and this is important because the solar panels produce direct current or DC power, and you have to use an inverter to uh, convert that into alternating current or AC, which we uh, primarily use in, in uh, most applications for using alternating current. So you'll have to have other pieces of that, your, your inverter, your uh, DC and AC disconnect, and other safety features. But... Uh, a number of other components go into that, more than we can talk about today. Um, two basic types of systems I want to touch on is, is just off and on gr and grid tied. So off grid, uh, it's important that you have a backup battery power, um, like a battery or something like that. Um, and, and the reason is with, with an off grid system, you're not having access to solar at nighttime. Okay, the sun's not shining at night, for instance, and so you're going to need a backup battery source. Uh, where you're stored the energy on the battery and you have access to that at nighttime or during inclement weather. Um, grid tied systems, uh, they're essentially using the uh, transmission grid as a backup. And so you can pull energy either from the solar, uh, from your solar panel, your solar array, or you can pull it from the uh, transmission grid, from the power lines outside your home or business. Uh, one caveat to this is that if there's a storm or some kind of outage on the transmission grid, uh, you'll need to make sure that your system can accommodate that power outage. Um, and so uh, power can, can uh, the inverter will be shut off um, 
for safety reasons. And so a lot of people go into it thinking that, well, if they have a solar panel installed, they will have power during an outage. And that's not necessarily true, but you need to design your system as such. And so that's just something I wanna point out there. Um, <clears throat> quickly, I'll just touch on the cost has come down and I won't go into detail here, but depending on uh, whether you're looking at a residential or a commercial system, the price is getting down close to maybe for a residential system might be $2.50 per, per kilowatt, <clears throat> uh, per watt rather, $2.50 per watt. Um, and, and you might be a little bit less than that um, for a commercial system uh, due to the economies of scale. A big portion of this is not only the equipment, but it's also the permitting and other soft costs with that. But for a standard uh, residential system on average here in the state of Maryland is about five kilowatts. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so for that standard five kilowatt system could cost about $10,000 after the 26% uh, tax credit. Um, one additional feature. Uh, one additional feature I want to point out is, is just uh, when you're looking at a big expense like that, looking at, you know, a five kilowatt system costing $10,000, it's a big expense. And so any cost savings that you can have from energy efficiency will be tremendously beneficial. And so I don't uh, teach any program without sharing the benefits of energy efficiency. Uh, so conserving, saving energy up front, uh, uh, investing in energy efficient appliances or equipment will save you a lot in the long run. I'll just give a quick example before I wrap up here on my portion, but quick example, very simplified example here, but looking at efficient lighting as an example. Incandescent bulbs are, are largely phased out now, but just as an example here, an incandescent light bulb, uh, based on my assumptions, would cost about $7, almost $8 a year just to operate that light bulb. If you replace that with an efficient LED light bulb, it would cost less than a dollar per year just to, to turn it on, uh, to leave it on for the same amount of time. So there is some direct uh, cost savings with energy efficiency. But on top of that, you're now able to design a smaller, less expensive solar electric system. And so that's the twofold benefit of energy efficiency. When you invest in an ener energy efficiency like LEDs, it could be a pump or motor that's more efficient. Um, any appliance that might need replacing, replace it with an energy efficient system. You'll have that direct cost benefit, but then you can design a smaller, less expensive uh, solar electric system. So that was a, a quick snapshot of what I hope to cover. And I know I kind of went over on time, but I'm going to pass the baton on to uh, Paul Geringer of, of uh, our Agricultural and Resource Economics Group. And uh, he's going to touch on uh, some of the legal, economic, and policy updates uh, related to solar. So Paul, I'll hand it off to you and, and I'll stop speaking now. Okay. And I think I have to tell you next slide, if I remember correctly, don't I, Drew? That'll work. Yes. Okay, if you wanna go ahead and go to the next slide, we can just breeze through this. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm gonna go through this um, kind of quickly and then I've got to hop off to go to another meeting. So I apologize for that. So you will get my um, contact info at the end. So if you have additional questions, follow up. And I think everybody else is, can try, is going to try to answer to the best of their ability as well. Drew's kind of already covered this part. My whole point of this is we're seeing a lot of solar development, not only in Maryland, but around the US because we are pushing towards this in some cases as a renewable energy form, just to see how much it has gone up. We see capacity going up over the past couple of years. I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next slide. and it's expected to grow 17%. You can go to the next slide. So we're gonna keep in mind some common issues to talk about um, with this, talk about some existing resources, and then I'm gonna talk about a grant project I'm involved in where we're looking at this. My main focus within that has been looking at how with solar utility scale and community solar in some cases, because the agreements are pretty similar in a lot of cases. How can landowners best negotiate these leases? What are some practice tips they've come up with? We're still working on that. And then developing resources for attorneys to better represent clients and help them in some areas where if solar development moves in, landowners can better get developed. And I'm really not gonna look for feedback today because there's not enough time, but we can go to the next slide. 
and then we'll talk about some common issues. So, so typically when we do this and we're looking at it, at least from, Drew's been talking a lot about small scale stuff. I'm looking at a lot of larger scale, utility size, community scale projects um, that are gonna be bigger than just putting on your rooftop. We're gonna take up some acreage with it on the farmland. Typically when we do this, there's going to be a letter of intent signed possibly. And this could all be in one agreement as I go down this list. That's just gonna show some intent to potentially develop the property. Then there's gonna be this option to lease. If everything goes right in this letter of intent, we hit all the benchmarks within it. Um, there'll be this option to lease. Potentially that gives the company a little bit more time to work through the process. This is not an easy process to work through. We're working through in a lot of cases, trying to connect up into the grid and there has to be space available on the grid and things have to line up all the permits and permitting has to go through from not only the county level, the state level, but then that the grid that we're a part of has to be included in that to make sure everything's going to hit. And then once all that's done and we have a project in place, we're gonna move to this solar lease that could be in existence for years. And that's where people sort of almost always have a lot of questions with. And if you wanna move on to the next one. So <clears throat> the first thing you wanna do is whatever you do in this, pay attention to how long these things run. Um, a friend of mine at Oklahoma State has been involved in doing renewable out energy outreach for a number of years and started out in the wind industry doing, or not in the wind industry, but doing it with wind. And with those agreements initially, those agreements would run with um, continuances that the company could um, put into place 150 years. So as he liked to point out, you know, if we sign this thing in 19 or 1860, we might almost be the at the end of it, you know, 150 years after the Civil War started and ended at some point there, and a number of other things have happened since this agreement might be coming to an end. So we really need to pay attention to how long these things run. In most cases, they don't run 150 years anymore. They're down to a manageable 20 to maybe 30 to a little bit longer, but for the most part, we're not seeing them run that long. In a lot of cases, we can go to the next slide. As I said, keeping keep track of renewals, renewals in those. When I came here 10 years ago and was helping with some of the energy outreach with the oil and gas leases that were being presented to folks, it looked like they were signing a 10 year lease, but in reality, based on the fact that the automatic renewal was in there, some folks were signing 20 to 30 year oil and gas leases that tied up property for long periods of time with no actual exploration. So within this, you need to pay attention to these. They're not the same. In some cases, oil and gas and renewables are not really the same. But when we're looking at it, you need to pay attention to how long they'll run because that could change plans for how that property is going to be used over time. We can go to the next slide. In that, pay attention to rent. For the most cases, they are not going to be royalty payments on production of solar energy coming off of that. They're typically going to be paid on a per acre basis. Um, and that's going to depend a lot on size of project, um, financing involved in the project, a bunch of other factors that go into it from talking to some developers. So there is no real hard and fast rule as to what a good rental rate you should be getting is. You can talk to neighbors potentially to see what they're being offered and maybe get some of that. There'll be clauses I'll talk about here in a minute that may limit some of that as well. Um, there has been some attorneys that will negotiate for royalty-based payments on this, and this would be so much based off per kilowatt hours produced. The issue with that is that's not that common in this region, and that is much more common in the West where they have a history of oil and gas production, and folks are much more interested in royalties than rental rates, and they're much more used to that royalty. This brings in a whole other host of problems that we need to think about in that, and we don't have time really to get into that today. So we can go on to the next slide. The final thing that most people always care about is you've got a solar project on your property. What happened, a big solar project on your property? What happens at the end of it? 
Almost all these leases contain a remediation clause in them that will dictate how this site is going to be mediated. My understanding, at least working through what I see in the CPCN documents and talking to people at the state is, this is Maryland's at least requiring as a part of that process a bond to cover, in theory, what this would cost to remediate the property in practice, it's usually good language just to include language, how this will be remediated to what standards, take pictures so folks know what we're dealing with, and what the condition was beforehand, just to make sure we can all get it back to that period of time. Because if it's 20, 30 years down the road, you may not be the person managing that property anymore. And people that are managing it at that point will need to know how to do that. So what are some resources available and um, these are all available online. They're all good resources to assist you if you're presented with these things. Um, we're working on a book right now. I have the draft in my folder and I actually just need to sit down and start reviewing it and start reworking it. I just haven't had time to go through the 60 page document yet to actually do that. So I'm hoping to get to that next month and slowly develop this, but if Drew wants to go to the next one. Two are from the National Ag Law Center. They have a um, farmland owner's guide to leasing solar that's um, by Hall, Bachelor, and Ronick. Um, that is available there. And then understanding solar energy agreements is also available there as, as well. Those, those are both good publications. We're working with um, Dr. Farrell out of Oklahoma State on our guide as a part of our project that I'll talk about here on the next in a couple of slides, I believe. But you can go to the next slide, Drew. Um, Penn State has one has done a bunch on this through their um, Shell Gas and Energy Loss or Energy Center. Um, they've done a number of webinars here recently, focused in on all types of questions related to solar, from legal to some other stuff as well. And you can find a lot of that there. I've worked with a few a few of their attorneys at their um, Ag Law Center there at Penn State, so they're they've got really good resources there as well that can help folks and answer a lot of questions beyond this. So then I will finish up with my last five minutes by talking about the project I'm working on. So with this, we developed this with Cornell and Oklahoma State um, looking at, you know, sort of the questions of as we go through this and we're seeing folks more and more leasing of land, farmland specifically for solar development, what can we do? to develop resources to build within the system to answer some of the basic, you know, legal education and extension education questions when it comes to those legal issues as well. We're working with folks at Cornell who did a lot um, looking at some of the economic development issues and community issues related to shale gas development. So they're bringing some of that expertise in. And then I'm working with my counterpart, the legal specialist at Oklahoma State, who's in their ag econ department, who has renewable energy background and helping with that to sort of develop out some legal guides. And we both kind of believe that the biggest area where folks struggle when we get to this is we don't have enough legal education out there for attorneys that we get landowners walking in to attorney's offices who don't understand how to negotiate these leases and may get scared by them. So we're trying to develop some continuing legal education stuff for them as well so that we, we negate some of those issues. So if we wanna to go to the next slide, you can find everything. So when our book is done, it will be on solarleasing.umd.edu. Um, we have some webinars up there we've helped sponsor through Penn State and coordinated with them on right now. And we're trying to get more stuff. As I said, I have a book in my folder right now that I need to review and get out. So hopefully that will be out before the end of the year. And we can go to the next slide. That's everything on that as a part of agris.umd.edu. This is a blog I do. We do a bunch of court cases and other stuff on it. And we can keep going through and I can give the Aurora folks more time. Um, this is our NIFA stuff. So thank you to NIFA for funding this project. It's a three-year project and we just started year three. So we're hoping to get the resources out and actually do some of our extension programming um, later this year. And there's my contact info and I'll hang out and answer questions that come up in the 
Q and A box until I have to leave closer to two. Well, thank you so much, Paul. That was a, a really uh, uh, interesting look, and and even considering the time frame of this is is so essential. And uh, thinking of eighteen fifty, that's uh, quite uh, a, a long term uh, uh, investment there, but. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, Paul, you're, you're welcome to stay around uh, for as long as you can. I believe there are still questions um, uh, coming into the uh, Q&A. And as a reminder, before we get to our next uh, uh, set of presenters, we'll, we'll just remind you to put your uh, any questions that you might have for the speakers into the Q&A. Again, we'll try to answer those uh, at, at the end of our program here this afternoon. Uh, if we don't have time to uh, get to any of your questions, we'll follow up with you as well. Um, with an email, we'll provide this recording uh, of our program today and some of the other resources, and we can follow up with any of those questions as we go forward. But uh, with that said, let me go ahead and, and move to our uh, next presenter. And uh, I want to invite uh, uh, Dr. Fairbors Majori and his colleague, Cord Briggs, uh, as I introduced earlier. Uh, but they're with Aurora Energy, as I mentioned. And um, I'll pass it off to them. I think there's a lot of uh, interesting um, experience and uh, um, that they can bring to this presentation. So uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll hand it off to you guys. Uh, thank you very much, Drew, yeah, for inviting us and then allow us yeah, to participate in your program. Uh, as you indicated, the Maryland is very friendly for the solar and that program that they have it today is a testimony that um, Maryland is really the place, unlike uh, some other states, uh, that they are not uh, promoting uh, that much solar. And thank you uh, for your contribution and then also expanding uh, the um, knowledge to the team. Uh, next, place. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to just also reiterate yeah, just the information or the presentation that Drew had it. So uh, in earlier stages, the solar concept should be, uh, um, you know, it should be proved. And, uh, you know, at that time from about 1994 to about 2006, our involvement was more or less proof of the concept. And we had installation in the White House under pool system, which have also the solar thermal and photoelectric or PV to just show that the solar is uh, working. We had a similar situation in Pentagon. We had a installation in NSA and NASA. All of that yeah, was founded yeah, by government to prove the concept. In 2006, almost yeah, the cost of the solar came to the level that was affordable in the commercial environment and it attracted more or less yeah, the, uh, you know, the Wall Street and then also especially Elon Musk that it is familiar to everybody. And they started yeah, the solar city. And from that point, because solar was uh, considered as a safe investment. The uh, shift goes yeah, from the climate to the uh, investment. Next slide, please. You can see yeah, just gradually the environment yeah, lost yeah, its, uh, uh, you know, its initial and also replaced with investment. Solar is a safe investment. And especially if you are considering that the lands are, uh, that they are not used or roof, they are underutilized assets and putting solar there, it is uh, converting to a safe investment. Next, please. So uh, the process of development, what steps uh, do you have to take? It is important yeah, to have a desire. It can be just yeah, based on the concern of the environment or concern about yeah, having yeah, some area that you don't know what to do with that and you can use that one in as a 
you know, safe investment, you know. To do that, the first thing is uh, doing uh, the due diligence, you know. The most important part of due diligence is uh, identifying the electricity usage because yeah, that will dictate how much space do you need it and how much uh, energy you can produce. The next step is yeah, just the uh, decision if you are going to put that solar on the roof on the roof or you are putting on the ground and the size of the system dictates uh, you know your selection of the, um, the installation of the system. The last part of that is your investment or the budget, you know, and how you are going to just yeah, you know, finance the solar. After this, do the diligence and you desire to move on, then the real world is starting. The single most important part of that is utility, utility interconnection. Unfortunately, our utilities, the way as it is, it is not designed to accept injection of power to the uh, grid. And, uh, you know, until uh, we have a smart grid, we have to live with the fact that we need uh, to have approval for utilities and also they will dictate the size of the solar that could be uh, injected into the system. So after that uh, great capacity, we can uh, go to the, uh, you know, permitting and also financing the system and then also the construction. I'm not uh, focusing or I'm not uh, spending uh, too much on the financing because my colleague Court is going to cover that uh, in depth. Uh, and then also he is going to share with you some of the challenges and that it is associated with the construction. However, uh, you have now a, you know, an asset, a valuable asset, and that asset uh, should be maintained and also being uh, in the top shape that you can uh, reap the benefit of your investment. Next slide, please. Now, we talked about the utility interconnection. The utility interconnection dictates uh, the size. And then unfortunately, it is uh, going to be um, saturated pretty soon. Once you make the decision, the first step that we are going to take is uh, secure your share of your interconnection with the utility. And that is the first and the most important part of the design, you know. After that, it comes the next challenge. It is uh, permitting, okay? For that one, we need uh, to first uh, identify the zoning, on, uh, on the land, or if you have yeah, the roof, that is okay. But if you are having yeah, the ground mount system, we have to develop a plan for the site. And that includes, depending on the county, depending on the local restriction, we have to just yeah, develop the access road to bring uh, the equipment there. And then also in case that something happened, then the uh, fire department can access the area. Then since we are going uh, to do something on the ground, we have to make sure that it is not going to be an uh, eyesore. And we are going to also pro propose uh, uh, landscape plans and also grading plans. On the top of that, it comes also the um, storm water uh, prevention system or a study that should be also included in the uh, permitting process. For our own interest, we are doing also a soil test to make sure that the installation of the system is not going to be uh, damaged 
by environmental situation such as wind or such as the um, you know snow load and so on and then we are making a pile test in the ground to make sure that the system uh, your array is going to be stable and also the ground yeah, is stable and then the last part is usually the construction and the construction is actually the shortest uh, part of all of that yeah sometimes depending on the zoning you might yeah, spend uh, months and sometimes a year to just yeah, go into the permitting so uh, we are lucky yeah, that we have yeah, some installation close to uh you know it's just in Howard county we are uh we can go to the next slide and you know, we had yeah, just yeah, some permits from uh owner of the mary's land farm uh, and that one is a sustainable solar farm and uh, depending on your interest please yeah, just yeah, contact Drew and register if you are interested to have a site visit. It is located near the Ellicott City in Howard County. And uh, that system is an average system of about yeah, 200 yeah, kilowatt, and it is in operation since June 2019. And uh, because of the yeah, lot of yeah, incentives yeah, that we got it in Maryland, that system uh, was yeah, extremely affordable and also there are things yeah, that draw and the team yeah, they can help you about the grants you know and also all of the support that you can get it yeah, from the different entities including Maryland Energy Administration for the system that you are planning yeah, to install. So that is uh, conclude uh, my uh, you know presentation because yeah, just yeah, Drew and Paul they covered yeah, the many area that uh, we we are going to in the next slide. Yeah, uh, court is going to focus on financing and also the uh, operation and maybe also part of yeah, the construction. Thank you very much, Court. It is all yours. Okay, thank you, Parabors. So, I want to dive into the uh, the dollars and cents here a little bit. Um, so, next slide. So, you know, has been uh, touched on. Uh, solar costs have gone way down. Um, you see that yellow line. Uh, basically, costs have fallen seventy five percent for solar installation since uh, two thousand and ten, and kind of no surprise. Uh, installations have grown, uh, you know, 12 times <laughs> since then. Uh, next slide. So, you know, what really drives solar uh, financials and payback and return? Well, there's a couple of different things that we'll dive into, at least at a high level here in the program. So the first one, tax benefits. So there are federal tax credits, um, that's known as the ITC, that are available. Um, there is the opportunity also to get bonus depreciation. So depreciate the entire uh, depreciable value of a solar installation the first year if you want to do that. Um, you have state level incentives, which are known as SRECs or Solar Renewable Energy Credits. Um, and these are payable uh, by the uh, megawatt hour of production. Um, so a nice uh, state incentive that both DC and Maryland have uh, in place. Um, you also, of course, have the ability to lock in energy savings for 25 years. In general, solar installations last for at least 25 years. That's the warranted life of a solar panel. Um, and you have the opportunity to, in essence, instead of paying your utility provider uh, 12, 13 cents, whatever you're paying, you can uh, get that same power directly from the sun. So there are different uh, financing options uh, available that we'll, we'll touch on. Um, and all of those are related, you know, well, they go across a range of projects, um, you know, specifically the energy savings. I'm touching on that. Um, I'm thinking of offsetting existing uh, utility usage that you have. 
There is another option, um, which was touched on, which is community solar, which is connecting uh, a solar installation directly to the grid. Um, and we'll touch on that a little bit uh, more further. So next slide. So here's just uh, some financing options. This is kind of a thick table, but uh, to touch on them quickly, um, you know, obviously you have a cash option. Um, if you have money in the bank, um, this is the most uh, attractive option because uh, you're not going to pay any kind of interest or no one else has to take a slice out of those revenue streams that I just uh, uh, touched on. You have a uh, capital loan operating lease. Um, so there are quite a few banks now throughout Maryland and, of course, the country who are very familiar with solar. Solar is a uh, asset class that they understand in detail and are comfortable uh, lending uh, people money to, to build. Um, and oftentimes, you know, the goal will be to whatever kind of loan or lease uh, that you're setting up, you want that amortization, the payment that you're making on the loan or lease to be less than the cash flow that you're receiving from uh, the solar. Uh, which can be a, a nice way to build a system. Obviously, not as much return as a cash uh, deal, but um, if structured uh, correctly, if you have a large enough system in the right place, um, you should be able to uh, be cash flow positive uh, for the length of the term. An interesting one to mention is uh, PACE financing. Um, so this actually allows you to take the cost, the construction cost of uh, you know, building a solar installation and add it to your property taxes. And then you can actually pay off, um, you know, there's some interest there as well, but you can pay off that installation cost over a very long period of time through your property taxes. Uh, final one here is uh, power purchase agreements. This is very, very common uh, in the market and is specifically for folks who are doing uh, building connected, you know, not direct to grid community solar, but building connected solar installations. Um, you can get a financial provider to come in and uh, basically sign a contract them or a contract with them for 20 to 25 years, um, which says that if you're paying 12 cents per kilowatt hour for your electricity, they will charge you, say, 8 cents or 10 cents, um, some kind of discounted rate for everything that the solar produces. So you get a solar uh, project built um, on your property. Uh, no upfront cost and uh, savings throughout the lifetime of the uh, the array. One that's not shown on here, which was mentioned and is more specifically related to community solar that Drew touched on would be a, I'm sorry, uh, Paul touched on, would be a lease. So a community solar lease that can be payable by acreage or just the overall uh, size of the uh, the system. And that would just be a, a straight yearly payment, uh, no upfront cost. Um, one thing to note, uh, uh, you know, about these different options, cash, capital, loan, operating, lease, pace, financing, all of these, um, you know, the site owner is actually the owner of the solar asset. So operation and maintenance um, expenses and decommissioning at the end of 2025 20, years, that would be on, uh, you know, the site owner, a power purchase agreement or a community solar lease payment. That actually, uh, that um, installation would be owned by the third party financial provider. Um, so all operation and maintenance expenses and decommissioning would be covered or ideally covered as Paul touched on by the uh, by that third party. So next slide. So diving into the different value streams of solar a little bit in detail. So electricity bill savings, obviously the main thing that people usually think about when you think about uh, making money from solar. Um, so solar electricity is always used first before electricity from the grid. So if you have, you know, 10 kilowatts of usage at your house, um, solar is producing 10 kilowatts, you're not going to bring in anything from the grid at that time. Um, every kilowatt hour, as mentioned, is going to replace one usually taken from the utility. Um, one interesting thing about building connected uh, solar installations is that in Maryland, uh, we have what's called net metering. So even if the solar array that you have in your property produces more electricity than you're using at any given moment, that excess production will actually be credited to your bill and you can offset your future usage at other times and solar is not producing with that, with that credit. 
Um, so you see in this graph here um, at the bottom, the orange is actually solar production, and then those uh, blue bars are um, energy use or you know the um, load of this uh, facility. So there's actually a little bit more production uh, from the sun than load in um, you know say March or April. That's not a problem. Those months you're going to get credits that will get added to your bill, which then will help offset usage that you're going to see uh, you know in September, you know, October, uh, when your load is actually higher than the solar production. Uh, next slide. The next one to dive into is uh, SREX or the Solar Renewable Energy Credit. So this is again a state level incentive. Um, it's paid uh, per one megawatt hour or one thousand kilowatt hours of solar generated. So every megawatt hour that any given system produces. Um, it get, goes through a, a broker um, and then eventually gets sold back to the utility for compliance purposes based on those RPS standards that Drew touched on. Um, and the current price in Maryland for an SREC is around $60. So that's six cents per kilowatt hour. So everything the solar produces, you're getting six cents per kilowatt hour minus some uh, transaction costs. Um, that will come back to you. Rates for SREX are driven by supply and demand. <clears throat> so that, you know, this graph, you do see some uh, fluctuation. They can go up and down based on supply and demand. However, in Maryland, with that very strong 14% solar carve out that Drew touched on, and given the fact that we're only at 4% now, um, the forecast is that Maryland SREX will uh, stay strong for years to come. Uh, next slide. And then we have tax credits. So this slide is uh, hopefully going to be outdated very, very soon. Um, so you see ITC rate, that's the uh, federal tax credit they touched on before at 26% um, in 2021, 26% in 2022, and then it was scheduled to drop to 22% in 2023, 10% in 2024 through uh, 2026. Um, the, in, um, excuse me, the Inflation Reduction Act um, once it is signed by President Biden, will actually increase the ITC uh, back to where it was uh, a couple of years ago, back to 30%, and we'll keep it at 30%, um, I believe, for around 10 years. Um, so that's going to be a real boon uh, for folks who want to go, go solar. Um, you still will have the bonus depreciation. Um, so you know, this is a this is a pretty big deal um, in terms of a, a, a cash flow because in year one, uh, you know, those uh, credits can offset a lot of the overall system costs or basically right away as soon as you use those credits. Uh, next slide. So just an example, you know, kind of putting these pieces together a little bit. Um, you know, as mentioned, those upfront savings from uh, tax uh, credits play a big part. I mean, you couple those with revenue from you know, not paying your utility and revenue from solar renewable energy credits, we typically see 40 to 50% of the total cost of an installation can be offset in that first year alone. Um, depending on project um, size, complexity, you know, other things, common payback for a, a ground mount solar facility in Maryland is, you know, around four to seven years, and that's on a 25 year asset. So, you know, definitely now is the time to go solar. Uh, Maryland SREX are uh, projected or, or kind of mandated to step down over time. Um, utility costs are volatile and likely to increase uh, faster than we've seen in the past due to inflation and the need for grid updates. So um, solar really does, um, you know, in our opinion, uh, present a very uh, financially rewarding option uh, for, for those who are interested. Uh, next slide. So just a, a quick word on community solar. So a lot of what I've been talking about um, has been geared to offsetting, um, you know, a load within a, a farm or a, a business. Community solar is a little bit different and it's pretty exciting. Not many states in the U.S. actually have the ability to offer community solar, um, but Maryland does as well as D.C. So in Virginia, maybe in, in the future. So just very quickly with community solar, 
Um, all the power from a community solar array is actually directly interconnected to the grid, utility grid. Um, that power is then, I call it notionally sold to subscribers. So can be anyone in the same utility district can actually say, I want a piece of that you know, megawatt, two megawatt community solar installation. And that uh, transaction goes through a subscriber organization that sits in the middle. And then the site owner is actually able to get paid from the subscriber organization who's collecting uh, basically the, the tariff from subscribers uh, for, for every kilowatt hour that he produces or she produces. Um, so that's a really nice way to use farmland. You know, you'll see this a lot if you see larger arrays throughout Maryland. Oftentimes these are uh, community solar um, arrays. And if you have a lot of space but not much load, it's a way to really, you know, take that land that you have that you may not be farming or doing something with and turn it into a, a steady revenue stream that either you own or you have someone else like a third party financial <clears throat> provider own and provide you with a, a lease payment. Uh, next slide. So just some timelines and takeaways. Next slide. So, you know, Faribor's touched on this a little bit, um, but, you know, it's it can be, I saw a question in the, or a comment in the, uh, the uh, Q&A here that someone has been a couple years working on a community solar installation. And it can take a while, um, depending on the project. So you kind of start off with that project evaluation, moving into contract with the uh, a company like Aurora Energy, you know, we're an installer um, that focuses on commercial um, installations, then into system design and engineering, and then into what we're calling due diligence here, which is really uh, permitting. And that can take, you know, two to 10 months, sometimes longer, depending on the county and the kind of challenges present on site. So you really want to work with a, with a good installation partner because it really does take a team between uh, you know regulatory specialist installer um, you know governmental folks installation as Faribors mentioned is pretty quick you know call it you know two to four months depending on the size of your installation it could be much much less a couple of weeks if we're talking about a small installation and then you have ongoing um, operation and maintenance which if you have a third party who has built your system and owns it will be taken care of by them if you have paid cash or taken a loan uh, that will be uh, on you to do and um, again most installers should be able to offer operation and maintenance uh, support there's not much to be done for solar because you know as drew touched on it is basically just sand silicone and glass it's inert there's no moving pieces except potentially in the inverter that changes the dc to to ac so maintenance is really fairly uh, minimal which is a nice part of, of solar uh, next slide. So final slide here, you know, solar can be profitably installed on farmland. Yes, absolutely. Um, depending on your load and the amount of space that you have, solar can offset 100% of a farm's electricity cost or be exported uh, directly to the grid uh, through a community solar interconnection setup. Installation is pretty quick and easy and uh, is obviously customized to different conditions. Um, solar revenue comes from federal tax credits, solar renewable energy credit, uh, credits, and uh, electricity bill savings, um, as well as, you know, you can get some grant money, which I saw a question come up about a REAP grant, which hopefully we can get to in the Q&A. And then um, ground-mounted uh, systems up to two megawatts can be used for community solar, and certainly uh, financing options are there that uh, if done right, can offer no upfront cost projects that are cash flow positive in, in year one. So those are the slides. That's what I wanted to cover here. So I guess I'll turn it back over to Drew. Um, here, well, here's some contact information. If you have any questions, Aurora has been in the business since 1994. We're happy to, to take a look at your practice. Well, thank you, Corden Fairboards. I, I appreciate the the input uh, on that. I found it uh, uh, interesting, always looking at the uh, timeline for this and the, the, the permitting requirements um, at, and the time and effort and uh, resources that go into all the permitting and, and additional steps and, and uh, also find it interesting on some of the um, 
uh, different uh, payment and ownership models, uh, of course, with uh, power purchase agreements and, and not owning the system, you, you don't have access to some of those same benefits, but there are uh, reasons for that. So I appreciate uh, both of you for sharing the light uh, on that. I also thank uh, Paul Geringer for, for uh, bringing to attention some of the resources uh, through uh, some of his uh, uh, ag leasing uh, and, and related initiatives. So uh, I'll share some of those resources momentarily, but I do want to get to uh, some of the questions that we're having coming in. Um, first, I'll, I'll uh, ask additional uh, survey questions here. So let me share that with the group. <clears throat> uh, three additional questions. Uh, if you could take uh, just a moment of your time to answer the questions. Uh, first question is, um, if you have any plans in the next six months um, to, to take action, again, uh, that's not our goal is to see 100% of our uh, uh, participants today install solar. Uh, I do think it's a good technology. Uh, there's a time and place for it, but uh, just out of curiosity, if, if anyone um, would take um, any of the following actions, uh, please indicate that. Uh, question number two, um, if, if you could get to that uh, question, is um, how much do you spend currently spend on electricity each month? Um, or how much do you plan to offset with a solar system? So if you're considering solar, um, could you indicate this, uh, essentially the, the size system that you're, you're looking into? Uh, you may not have an idea and you can indicate that you don't know, but um, if, if you do have an idea of what your utility bill is and, and how much you'd like to offset, that 100%, uh, please give us an idea there. And the third question is, uh, again, a follow-up to what was asked at the uh, uh, beginning of our session. And hopefully you've learned a little bit of information and we'll continue that with our questions if you're able to stick around and have your questions answered. Uh, but how much do you know? Do you consider you're an expert now? Um, hopefully you've, if you started at a novice, hopefully you've gained some information from this program. Um, um, but please, uh, give us your, your um, input there, and I'll give just another minute uh, if you could respond to each of those questions. So out of three questions there. Uh, and, and while we're waiting for uh, those survey responses to come in, I just ask that uh, you continue to put any questions that you have into the Q&A uh, uh, chat box, uh, the Q&A box, and uh, we'll answer those momentarily. <clears throat> Give you about 10 more seconds to respond to that uh, question and we'll move on. Um, so we have a number of people that will be seeking additional information, uh, educating others and, and perhaps contacting a, an installer uh, for systems. Um, looking at a lot of smaller uh, systems, less than 5,000 kilowatt hours. Uh, uh, among some other larger projects as well. And uh, responses for question number three is uh, a little bit of knowledge gain. It seems like there's uh, about 40% or at the intermediate level. And I'd have to look back on, on what we started with at the beginning of our program today. But uh, hopefully, like I said, there's some folks that have learned some information here. So again, I will close this survey. So thank you for your input. Uh, uh, Quick announcement as well, there'll be a follow-up email. I know some people have asked that question if this recording and uh, information will be available. Uh, so there will be a follow-up email to this uh, program later this week with access to this uh, video recording. Uh, I'll include the contact information for all the speakers, including myself, uh, and feel free to reach out to me in the meantime. Uh, presentations will be available um, and any accompanying resources uh, will make available I know uh, several of us have mentioned uh, some external resources, uh, informational resources. We'll include those in the email uh, and we'll provide any uh, uh, news about upcoming events, uh, particularly uh, uh, Fairbores uh, mentioned a, if anyone's interested in a site visit uh, to, to a, a operational solar project on a farm, uh, we could uh, coordinate that. So feel free to reach out to me and we'll include some, some options there in, in the follow-up email. Uh, you'll also receive some correspondence uh, at the conclusion of the program here on teaching evaluations. Uh, please take a minute to, to complete that form so that we can improve uh, programs like this in the future. Um, and, and as part of our funding resource for this, we'll uh, issue a six and 12 month survey if you could 
uh, just be on, on the lookout for that and, um, and promise not to spam everyone with uh, notices, but um, we, we will collect a six and 12 month survey if you could uh, give us some feedback on, on any outcomes that may come about from uh, this educational program today. <clears throat> um, with that said, uh, uh, we'll go over to the uh, questions and I know uh, tried to answer those as, as we go, but there's still some questions coming in. So feel free to do that and we'll stick around as long as we can to answer those. If we can't, then uh, we'll try to respond to those in the email later. Um, and, and as I'm pulling up those questions, I'll uh, remind you the recording will be available um, and um, we'll post it on that website listed there, extension.umd.edu slash energy. Okay, so um, first question here is uh, UMD doing any research on dual use uh, solar projects, agrivoltaics? Uh, not currently any research projects. There's tremendous interest from uh, the University of Maryland um, in that and some of our partners and constituents are, are interested in that. Uh, that will be more of a long-term initiative for us to launch that and um, the best way to keep informed on that would be through our energy newsletter. We do have some uh, research and extension faculty with the University of Maryland engaged in that, uh, primarily uh, not from a field uh, applied side, but more from a research standpoint. Uh, but it is within our interest and um, priority to uh, support uh, farmers and other groups that are doing that and, and will likely in the in, in the long term, um, um, look into implementing a, a dual use agrivoltaic project. And so that would be uh, where you're mixing uh, 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 agricultural production uh, with agrivoltaics. And in some cases, what we're seeing from a research standpoint is the cost is a little prohibitive for the, um, for the equipment uh, to, to support both. Um, it's easy to mix uh, something like uh, sheet, and we're seeing that come on board a lot more. Um, with, with small livestock like that. Uh, but when you're talking about uh, a small vegetable production or something up in that nature, um, we're not, I'm not aware of any sites uh, within the state of Maryland that are doing that currently, but that is within our interest to do that. I don't know if uh, the group from Aurora would have any input on dual use, uh, but we're not seeing any in this, in this area on that. So all I would say is that um, we have not installed a, a dual use, um, to my knowledge, but um, we have proposed one. And uh, you know, one thing to to note about solar design is that uh, you know the most common kind of design out there is you have you know basically two modules on a rack, um, and you actually, based on stormwater requirements, have to have you know, usually it's around 12 feet of space between individual module rows. So that's a that's a decent amount of uh, space there. So we talked to one customer who was interested in potentially growing some like blueberries um, in between the rows. Um, so it's certainly uh, feasible, um, just to my knowledge hasn't been, hasn't been done that much. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of caveats to that with equipment and, and access to it, uh, but it, you know, I'm, I'm aware in other states where you can work with your um, um, installer and, and really tailor that to fit your needs, um, if, if need be, um, where, where you can get in and, and operate around that land. But there are a lot of caveats, like I said, to that, um, and, and it does present its own challenges. Um, another question here, um, can you discuss your approach to decommission and site mitigation and what happens if a leased array is purchased by another company which does not support an agrivoltaics approach or similar uh, decommissioning mitigation. And, and uh, you know, I'll start with, with uh, at least my perspective on this and, and then I'll open it up to uh, uh, Cord and, and Fairboards as well. But, um, and, and I can make these questions available to Paul Geringer as well if he uh, has any insight on this after the fact, but uh, he had to jump off early. But, um, in, in terms of decommissioning and, and site mitigation, the, the leases uh, that I've seen and that Paul has seen, uh, to the best of my knowledge, um, they're fairly boilerplate uh, in, in terms of decommissioning. Um, and, and there's not been a whole lot of that, considering the lease terms, 20, 25 years, we haven't seen a whole lot of that decommissioning actually 
happen. I mean, we can look at uh, similar uh, projects where wind turbines or oil pipelines are decommissioned and the uh, ground is supposedly reverted to uh, its original uh, condition. It's not always the case, uh, but that's something you'll have to really work uh, carefully in, in um, uh, navigating a, a lease or a contract before you sign it. Make sure you're working, working through that kind of detail with an attorney uh, at hand so that you don't uh, uh, end up in a situation that's unfavorable. Um, but um, in terms of the agrivoltaic aspect of it, um, I, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll just open it up to to court and fair boards here if they have any additional thoughts on, on leased arrays um, on agrivoltaics. Uh, a lot of times, if, if you don't own the system, I, I don't see it as, as you're going to be too favorably accessing the land. Um, you know, there's typically fenced in and, and they don't want, uh, there is high voltage in those areas and they don't want you accessing those areas necessarily. But like I said, I'll, I'll open it up to you guys. On that one. We, we had yeah, one example, you know, we, the installation that we had it yeah, in Pentagon because yeah, the grant was yeah, extremely valuable for them. Department of Energy or Department of Defense decided yeah, to uh, decommission that area or that solar system. We did decommission that one and packed it together and sent it to California for the other base to use the same equipment. That is yeah, the one system that we uh, you know, we were involved with that one. And again, it is yeah, the value of the land. If the value of the land is yeah, higher than the solar investment, then the commission is there. If it is yeah, just yeah, the end of life of the solar, then you are talking about resale value and some of the product, uh, they could be sold uh, in the you know, secondary market and will be uh, just uh, sent to other area or sold uh, overseas. Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, I think every uh, um, installer is going to handle it a little bit different, but um, just, just make sure you're that's all detailed in, in the agreement that you make with the uh, contractor. <clears throat> um. So I don't know if there's time, but there was one question that came in about reap grants, um, which sure. seeing the audience, I think would be a, a worthwhile yeah. topic to very quickly touch on. So reap grants um, are specifically for solar installation um, and they're from the USDA, and they can be quite uh, lucrative. Um, so there are some criteria that need to be met, um, such as agricultural producers need to have at least 50% of the gross income, uh, you know, coming from agricultural operations or be a small business in an eligible rural area. Um, but yeah, USDA, if you're awarded, can give you up to 25% off of your your installation um, there are certain cycles you have to submit at certain times review time periods things like this it's usually impossible to get a reap grant before construction starts but if you're a farm and you're considering solar installation you should definitely be thinking about reap grants and how to how to work that in because that's a great incentive Yeah, that's a good point. And we, we can include that as a resource uh, as we follow up uh, later this week. But um, yeah, USDA REAP grants are, are, are very important. And I, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you, you would need an energy audit to, to apply for that 75%. Uh, Is that correct? Uh, I, I'd have to look at the stipulations for, for that. But this is a renewable energy, yeah. yeah. I'll have I'm to not look aware into of an energy audit requirement. Okay, that may, that may be they're very for, easy to talk to over there. Okay. There's a guy Bruce Weaver who you can just call him up and he'll talk to you. So <laughs> it's helpful. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, that's a, that's a good point too. So uh, okay. Um, 
another question. It seems like there's some more questions on uh, dual use. Uh, so uh, it's a comment here that can be done and still be profitable for everyone. If we take the land out of production for solar, it weakens our attempts to provide more local food options, makes it difficult to address food uh, insecurities from your comments. It seems that research is needed sooner than later. Uh, so appreciate that comment uh, related to dual use. I mean, we do have the pollinator friendly designation uh, and, and that's a little bit more sustainable in terms of, of not spraying or uh, mowing uh, as much if you have that pollinator plants growing in the area. That, that's one aspect, uh, but in terms of food production, that, um, that that will be something that's essential as we go. We do have uh, plenty of urban um, and, and rooftop space and, and urban areas to install. It's not, I mean, a carport is, is over a developed area, um, and, and that's, uh, in, in my mind, that would be a much more viable area before you look at, at all farmland, uh, but dual use will be uh, definitely something to look into as we move forward. Um, another question is, um, <clears throat> let's see, about estimates from uh, multiple installers before signing a contract. And I think right within the question is, is your answer. I, I would definitely advise you to get uh, uh, multiple estimates uh, before you sign any contract. Um, and, and we do have tools and, and resources online, um, and I could connect you with some of those to, uh, uh, resources and information to help compare um, um, estimates. And, and you might get uh, one estimate from uh, someone that is uh, a little bit uh, uh, different in terms of the size system or uh, different uh, equipment. And, and sometimes it's hard to compare one uh, bid from, from another bid. Uh, but I, I typically recommend you get three of those and, and uh, compare it on a, a per watt basis on, on terms of the system and look at the components and some of the other factors that go into it. But uh, you really do have to navigate that. And I think there's some questions that we do have a list of, uh, we don't endorse any business or installer, but we do have a list of, of installers. It's, it's not always, uh, we're not able always able to keep up to date and current on that, those contacts, but on our um, University of Maryland Extension webpage, you can go into the energy area and find a list of installers. Uh, but I, I recommend that you follow up and, and make those calls yourself and work with those installers and, and, and look at multiple bids on a project before you sign the contract. Uh, there's another question here. Is there a need in Maryland for such systems considering the need for electricity for farming? Um, I, I, and that was a that was kind of a follow up question that I tried to answer in the in the chat, <clears throat> which the original question was: Does Maryland um, kind of use or can you use standalone systems like solar water pumping, drip irrigation systems, or purification purification of water systems? So I think that's a question about specific uh, you know smaller panels to power equipment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's there's a lot of opportunity for that and. Uh, and I'll tell you one thing with those smaller systems, there's not the uh, headache of permitting and, uh, and, and inspection and all that uh, that goes with it. If it's a temporary structure or smaller system, um, there, there's a little less uh, uh, cost and, and uh, investment in it. Um, but there's tremendous potential for that. Uh, again, we do have resources um, more geared towards that type of, of project on our extension webpage uh, and video resources on, on smaller projects for, for farm use. Um, so feel free to uh, explore some of those resources we have on the University of Maryland extension page. Um, from my end, it's, it's looking like uh, there's no more questions coming in, if I'm not mistaken. Um, have we got to all those yet? Yeah, I, don't, I think so. Yeah, so uh, well, well, with that said, I, I, I think uh, we'll, we'll start to close out here today. Again, uh, be on the lookout for a follow-up uh, with the uh, reporting and some of the resources that we shared or contact information. Uh, and if you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out to myself and any of the other uh, speakers that we had on our program today. Uh, but with that said, I hope this program has been uh, informative to you and, and has provided you with the tools and information that you need to make an informed decision on solar energy. 
Uh, and if it is something that you want to look more into or you need a little bit more information on, feel free again to reach out to us and we'll help guide you in that process. Uh, but uh, thank you for participating and, uh, and, and perhaps we'll be in touch on our next program.